Father in heaven, unless you build the house, they that labor, labor in vain. Unless you're in this teaching, our best efforts will come to naught. So we are praying for your Holy Spirit. We're praying that you would so saturate your word in our minds and hearts that miracles will take place in our lives. We pray that you would be the one who teaches us. You would impress so strongly upon us what you want us to learn that we will know we have heard from you. I pray that everyone here will be greatly affected by your word today. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like for you to open your Bibles to Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8. We are continuing our walk with Jesus. The story we're going to read today is a beautiful story. It's a unique story. It's only told by Mark in the Gospel of Mark. It begins in verse 22, chapter 8, verse 22. Then he came to Bethsaida, and they brought a blind man to him and begged him to touch him. So he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the town. And when he had spit on his eyes and put his hands on him, he asked him if he saw anything. And he looked up and said, I see men like trees walking. Then he put his hands on his eyes again and made him look up. And he was restored and saw everyone clearly. And he sent him away to his house saying, Neither go into the town, nor tell anyone in the town. This is the only miracle recorded in the Bible done by Jesus in stages. All the other miracles were instantaneous. This is done by stages. It will help us to understand this story and this passage if we look at the context for those of you who have been listening for a number of weeks now, you'll recognize that Jesus has been in the region of Decapolis. Decapolis means ten cities. There were ten Greek cities on the south side of the Sea of Galilee, primarily uh, lived in, occupied by Gentiles. So Jesus was working with Gentiles in the region of Decapolis. Jesus healed a man. The man was deaf and had an impediment in his speech. After that, Jesus went, sat on the side of a mountain. The people sat down and listened to him teach for three days. At the end of three days, Jesus miraculously fed 4,000 men, the uncounted number of women and children, with just a few loaves and some fish. When we go to Mark chapter 8, verse 10, we see what happened after that. In verse 10 it says, And immediately he got into the boat with his disciples and came to the region of Dalmanutha. So Jesus fed the 4,000, as they are called, got into a boat, and cross the lake or the sea over to Dalmanutha. Verse 11. And the Pharisees came out and began to dispute with him, seeking from him a sign from heaven, testing him. But he sighed deeply in his spirit and said, Why does this generation seek a sign? Assuredly, I say to you, no sign shall be given to this generation. And he left them. And getting into the boat again, departed to the other side. So you see at this time in Jesus' ministry, he's crisscrossing the Sea of Galilee back and forth. There are many scholars who say this is the end of Jesus' ministry in the region of Galilee. In fact, they will say he will perform no other miracles in Galilee. Galilee, as you know, is the northern region of Israel. In fact, our next story, we will find Jesus about 20 miles north of where he is in this story. When we come to verse 14, 
we continue in this context portion of the sermon. In verse 14 it says, Now the disciples had forgotten to take bread, and they did not have more than one loaf with them in the boat. So as they're going across the Sea of Galilee again, they only have one loaf of bread with them. Jesus, in verse 15, is speaking of something entirely different, but they don't get it. In verse 15, he charged them, saying, Take heed, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. So the Pharisees and Herod had leaven, or yeast, that Jesus is telling them to beware of. He is likening their teachings and beliefs to sin, which permeated everything that they did or taught. But his disciples don't get that. Verse 16, So they reasoned among themselves, saying, It is because we have no bread. Now I want you to note a human characteristic in this part of the story. They reasoned among themselves. This is the common human experience of collecting each other's opinions and drawing conclusions not from God, but from others. I want you to think about that for a moment reasoning among themselves. They are at this point in their journey spiritually simply pooling their ignorance. They don't understand. But they do what we do. When there's a crisis in your life, is your first response to speak to God about it? You may. I hope it is. But generally, if that's not our first response or followed immediately after that response is we start talking to people. What, what would you do? What are we supposed to do? And so forth and so on. They reasoned among themselves. Let's go on in verse 17. And Jesus, being aware of it, said to them, Why do you reason because you have no bread? Do you not yet perceive nor understand? Is your heart still hardened? This word understand is a key for us to understand the story we are studying. It will be mentioned again in verse 21, but let's continue reading. In verse 17, And Jesus, being aware of it, said to them, excuse me, verse 18, Having eyes, do you not see? Having ears, do you not hear? And you do not remember. And do you not remember? Verse 19. When I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many baskets full of fragments did you take up? They said to him, 12. And when I broke the seven for the 4,000, how many large baskets full of fragments did you take up? They said, seven. So he said to them, how is it you do not understand? Now the Greek word that is used here is a very important word. It is rich in its flavor. It means to comprehend. We get that. But to comprehend in the context of companionship. In other words, something that is explained in the context of a relationship. And uh, as we will see as we study on further, to comprehend, to understand spiritual things, we need God in the equation. Now, Mark was not here when these stories took place. Mark heard these stories from the apostle Peter. And Mark writes his gospel to the believers in Rome, some of whom were Gentile, some of whom were Jewish. He's very careful in the selection of the words that he uses to describe the story. And remember, the story comes to him from Peter. This Greek word to understand 
is only used a couple times by Mark. You remember the story of Peter on the Friday morning of the day that Jesus would die. Jesus had warned him the night before that before the rooster crowed, Peter would have denied Jesus three times. Peter insisted that's not going to happen. Everyone else could forsake him. He is there. He is strong. He will do what is right. When the young lady is accusing Peter of being a follower of Jesus, one of the things Peter says as he is cursing to prove he doesn't even know Jesus, he says to the woman, I do not understand what you are saying. Peter is declaring he was out of relationship with God at that time. We go to Mark 7, verse 14. In Mark 7, verse 14, and when he, that's Jesus, had called all the multitude to him, he said to them, hear me, everyone, and understand. The same word. Hear me, everyone, and understand. In Romans chapter 3, <clears throat> Where Paul is describing the sinfulness of man, the fallenness of humanity, in chapter 3, verse 10, he says, As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. Verse 11, there is none who understands, there is none who seeks after God. The human experience is we simply do not understand God, nor do we naturally seek after God. One author has written that man is absolutely and unimaginably blind to the activity of God. We don't see it, and we certainly don't comprehend it. And Jesus' ministry was to help us to understand. It's in connection with God that we can begin to comprehend. Now, all that to bring us to Mark chapter 8, verse 22, the story that we are studying. Remember, the apostles do not understand what Jesus is doing. Jesus has about one year left to bring them up to speed. They discuss the issue among themselves instead of going to him. They do not seek for understanding in companionship with Jesus. The only way to begin to understand the activity of God is to be alone with God, which happens to be the title of the sermon today. Alone with God. Verse 22. Then he, that's Jesus, came to Bethsaida. Bethsaida was on the north side of the Sea of Galilee, primarily, uh, primarily a place where Gentiles live, and it's likely a Gentile is the man that is brought to him in this story. It says, and they brought a blind man to him and begged him to touch him. Jesus' method of healings many times was touching people. And so they want that for their friend. This man was not born blind. We can tell from the story because as it unfolds, he is able to describe things which a person born blind wouldn't say. I don't know if you've had the opportunity to converse with people who are blind. One year, many years ago, I was the camp pastor at Camp Timber Ridge in Indiana. And they had blind camp. And they brought young people in who were blind. And I became friends with one of them, and we were riding in the boat together. 
And I said, what, uh, what are you imagining right now? What, what does it look like to you? And he said, well, I was born blind. I don't even think in terms of seeing things. I don't imagine what images are or what they might look like. He said, I feel and I sense. And I said, well, what do you feel and sense? He says, I know I'm in a large open area and that's what I feel and that's what I sense. He had no concept of what the boat might look like or the water skier behind the boat. And so when this gentleman is able to describe men as trees walking about, it's evidence that he was not born blind. Blindness back in this time period was a problem that many people had. You see, it's only been about 150 years that humanity has come to the knowledge of how disease works. Hygiene was not a part of the world back when Jesus walked. And a person could get an infection in their eyes. They didn't know what to do with it. The doctors didn't know what to do with it. And many times it would lead to blindness. So everywhere you went, there were blind people because of the status of health and what they understood. So this man had become blind at some point in his life. When we go to verse 23, it says, So he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the town. I want you to picture that. It's very important to what the story is. Mark is going to give us very specific details about this story. Jesus takes the blind man by the hand. He holds the hand. He leads him out of the town. We continue reading. So he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the town. And when he had spit on his eyes and put his hands on him, he asked him if he saw anything. Do you see anything? Verse 24, he looked up and said, I see men like trees walking. It's fuzzy. It's unclear. Then he, that's Jesus, put his hands on his eyes again and made him look up. And he was restored and saw everyone clearly. So Jesus holds the man's hands, leads him out of town, spits into the man's eyes. Jesus put his hands on him. Jesus asks if he saw anything. The man looks up, sees men like trees walking around. Jesus puts his hands on him again, or on his eyes, excuse me, and Jesus made the man look up. The man's eyesight was restored. He saw clearly. Now this is a true story, and it happened as it is written. But there's more to the story. You see, Mark's miracle stories are all living parables. Living parables. Jesus is teaching in this story. He is teaching those apostles who do not understand, he is teaching those who would believe because of the Word of God, which would include the people Mark wrote to, and it would include us. Jesus is teaching us through this story. It is a parable to help us understand. You see, seeing is not the same as understanding. Understanding the things of God is only for the person in companionship with God. Now, I want to ask you a question. When that man came to Jesus, 
Could Jesus simply have said, be healed? And the man would have been healed. No problems. Jesus did not heal him that way. Jesus healed him in increments. Each of those stages with a lesson. Well, I want to show you a verse today. You may be familiar with this verse. I don't know. It's found in Jeremiah chapter 33. It is an amazing verse. It is what this parable is all about. In Jeremiah 33 verse 3, God says this, Call to me, and I will answer you, and show you great and mighty things which you do not know. Wow! I have that written in the front of my Bible so that when I prepare a sermon, I think about that. Call to me, God says, and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things which you do not know. That's God's invitation to us. And Jesus is demonstrating it in living color. Jesus takes the man by the hand and leads him. I've never been blind. I can't imagine what it's like being blind. But for this man to move forward, he's got to have direction. And Jesus simply reaches down, grabs his hand, and begins to walk. The touch of Jesus had to be tender, gentle, firm, authoritative. He was God leading one of his sheep. This man is totally blind, totally dependent, and totally trusting. They go to be away from the town. This is a picture of being alone with God. Now, is there condemnation for this man coming from Jesus? No. Is there any negative posturing by Jesus? No. There is only love, acceptance, patience, willingness to bring comprehension, and companionship. And the healing happens incrementally. Possibly, Jesus was building on the faith that the man has. And as it got to the point where he could see in a fuzzy way, maybe his faith is growing and Jesus builds on that. Don't know. It may be as simple as this, that if we are going to journey from darkness to sight, being led by God, it is going to require of us spending time to get understanding from Him. I know when we want an answer, we want it fast. But I don't know if you've ever thought about this or not. Jesus is teaching a close experience with God through this parable. We're all walking in darkness, if you will. And we all need leading, and God is willing. Spiritually, the Lord will take us by the hand, and He will walk us to where we can be alone with Him so He can teach us. I ask you, if that process 
has to be repeated a number of times for us to get comprehension on a subject. Is that an inconvenience or is that a glorious privilege? We get to be in the presence of Almighty God through Jesus Christ. It is not an inconvenience. What a privilege if we go to the Lord and pour our, heart, our hearts out to God and there's not an immediate answer to our prayers. Praise God, you go back again. You get to be in the presence of God. And so this man incrementally comes to an understanding and that man is demonstrating our experience in the Lord. If we will let the Lord take our hand and lead us gently and lovingly to a quiet place where we can hear from Him, that quiet place primarily will be the Word of God and prayer combined. That's how God speaks to us primarily. He may speak to us from a song. He may speak to us with a circumstance. But his primary way of speaking to us is by ourselves, reading the Word of God and praying to the Lord about what we have read. So, what do we do with this? Let's put it together. Understanding comes to us in companionship with God. Calling to God is praying and reading the Bible. We humble ourselves to His hand of leading in our lives. He will answer us. He will show us great and mighty things. He will give us comprehension and we will see what he wants us to see. This can only be done when we are alone with God. Jeremiah 33, verse 3. Would you read that out loud with me? Call to me, and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things which you do not know. So today, my question to you is, is there anyone here who would like the Lord to take your hand, lead you to a quiet place, and bring comprehension to you about spiritual things, even things which are great and mighty which you do not know? If you would like that experience and you want to tell that to the Lord, I invite you to stand. Father in heaven, thank you for this beautiful story. May it be lived out by every one of us. We pray in Jesus' name.